Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. Today we are studying the prophet Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, 2a, that is the first portion of the second chapter. The chapters here are somewhat longer than the ones that we had when we were studying the 12 minor prophets earlier. So many of these chapters need to be broken up into, into their component parts. So today we'll be studying from verse 1 through verse 13. We just finished with um, Jeremiah's Yirmiyahu's first, first uh, prophecy in which God told him, I am ready and soon going to carry out this, this uh, um, punishment, this uh, this uh, prophecy that I'm asking you to tell the people about. I am, it is going to come from the north and northern countries are going to come and punish Israel and destroy them because of their uh, misbehavior, because of their evil ways. And then God said, Yirmiyahu, I know that it's going to be tough. I know that it's going to be difficult. I know that people are not going to listen and they're going to challenge you and they're going to make you suffer because you're bringing them a message they don't want to hear, but I will stand by your side. Say what I'm telling you. Don't be afraid. I will protect you. That's how we finished. So now God is specifically telling Yirmiyahu what it is that he wants him to say to the people. And the word of God to me was as follows. That's verse 1. We always start, one gets people to listen usually when he starts off with something nice, something pleasant, a compliment. If you start off just criticizing, it's unlikely that the prophet is going to get a crowd of listeners. I'm trying to imagine your Mio as a Kohen, as a priest, uh, speaking to the masses of people in Jerusalem as they come to the temple to pray, come to the temple to bring their sacrifices and worship God. And your Mio is there to tell them, that uh, guys, there's there's a serious trouble ahead if we don't mend our ways, if we don't improve. If he would start off speaking critically, he probably wouldn't get too many people paying attention. And uh, and God also wants to make it extremely clear to the people that even though I am going to predict and meet out destruction and punishment, but that's not my aim, that's not my goal, that's not my objective. What I really want to do is preserve the people because I love you. And that's how God starts. I want you to go out and call out, literally this means to the ears of Jerusalem, meaning the people, the crowds, of the people in Jerusalem that are, that are ready to listen. Lamar saying as follows, So says God, Zoharti loch chesed nuraya. Zoharti, I do remember, I recall the wonderful kindness, the wonderful love that there was between us when you were young. Ahavas kilulo soyech. The, the uh, love that we had, like uh, the, the love when you were like a bride, when you were newly married to me. The love that was between us then in the early days, the days of passion between us. When were those days? The days in the desert after God and the Jewish people, so to speak, married each other, meaning they, they made a covenant with each other at Sinai to be a nation, the people agreeing to be a nation of God and God agreeing to lead them and to lead them to the land of Israel to help them establish a temple and a kingdom so that they can be God's messengers to the world. At this time, what did you do then? You walked after me, you followed after me through a desert, Barretz, Lozerua, and a land that was not planted. I didn't bring you through planted fields, I brought you through a barren wilderness. And you followed me, you followed me all the way here to Jerusalem, to the land of Israel. The, for those that have studied the uh, five books of Moses, the Torah, you would recall that this, this beautiful memory, this beautiful idea of the people and the love between the people and God and how they followed God blindly through the wilderness, we, it kind of doesn't really fit the uh, image that we really have from reading the Torah itself because if most of you would remember the sin of the golden calf, the complaints when they didn't have water, the complaints when they... When, um, 
uh, of the spies. I mean, there were so many, so many incidents over and over and over again where the people acted stubbornly and didn't want to follow God, and they wanted to turn around and go back to Egypt, and it's long, uh, you know. So, but here God is remembering a different aspect, and it's whenever one looks at a situation um, one has an opportunity to try to see the positive and to try to see the negative it's almost cliche but it's extremely true so I'll say it here when God looks at the relationship of the past he wants the people to know that I see the positive that I know what you did I remember when you said when you said we will do we will listen we will accept the Torah. We will accept it at Sinai. God remembers the songs of the people at the sea, the songs when they were delivered from, from, the, from Egypt. God remembers how they packed up their bags and left into the desert uh, in the middle of the night, running away um, from, from their Egyptian masters. God remembers those times, those positive times. Uh, how, and he wants us to know that those things bound us, meaning bound the people to God in a way that will live and last forever and that that love is always there and that the, and God will always, uh, you know, look at, at people um, in, 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 in a objective but loving way where he fully understands and grasps all of the influences and all of the challenges that we went through. So right now, God is reminding us of the bottom line. The bottom line is that there is a covenant, there is love, and this will never go away. Kodesh Yisrael Adonai, God reminds us in verse 3, Israel is holy to God. Reshit tivu ato. They are the first of the, of the harvest. Now the first here also could mean the best of the harvest, the choicest of the harvest. This is a reference to the first fruits. Um, the um, that one brings to when uh, in the land of Israel the first fruits one brings as an offering to God at the temple and brings and celebrates before God at the temple. This is racist that's bikurim. It's also it's also sometimes could be understood as a reference to teruma, which is the teruma is the um, portion that a person is supposed to separate from his from his crops and give to the the, the priests. To help so that they have sustenance, so that they have what they need in order to continue their labor of serving and worshiping God in the temple and leading us. So Reishis Tivu and so and and is is as a reference to really the choicest, the best fruits, the the fruits that are most treasured. These are the fruits that we give to God, and God is saying, "You Israel, you are my Reishis Tivu so You are the first fruits." And it's interesting this 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 metaphor here because. God is looking at the people of Israel as a people that he plucked out of the rest of the world. In other words, teruma, when we take a portion of our fruit and give it to God, right? What we're doing is saying, this is our choice of stuff. I want this to be something that will bring about some good in this world. I'm going to give it to the Kohen, to the priest, so that he can go on his mission and teach, so that he's not burdened with the necessity to make, to, 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 to make a livelihood and to farm himself. And um, this is how God looks at the people of Israel. Out of this world, this world of nations, he plucked or he took, he gathered a group and he made this the holy group. This holy group is God's offering to the world to make the world a better place. The purpose of bringing, of taking that teruma, of taking that offering is not just to make it a holy offering. But just like when one takes truma, the purpose of taking that portion to give it to the priest is so that the priest can make the world, can go on in this holy task, and so that the rest of the food can now be eaten, and so that the rest of the food can now fulfill its, its purpose. This was the purpose in taking, separating the Jewish people. Kol ochlav yeshamu, and therefore all those that that eat it, or all those that, that eat of the fruit, meaning here they, that eat of the fruit of Israel meaning they destroy and they harm and they hurt my people yeshamu they will be guilty ra'atavo alayhim evil will befall them no madonai so says god i want to remind you here this is the most important thing to remember and we mentioned this when we studied the first chapter as well 
that although God gave permission to those people, in this case the Babylonians, the people of the northern countries, to come and destroy and attack, because the people of Israel, the people of Judah, were, 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 were deserving of punishment, that does not mean that it gives those people carte blanche to perpetrate horrific evil and suffering upon the pe Jewish people. And this would go not just for the Jewish people in any case. Even war does not allow and does not permit indiscriminate, awful destruction and plunder and rape and, and abuse. The purpose is that God said, okay, I'm going to let you attack. I'm going to let you. But the, the type of, of, um, of suffering that was perpetrated upon the people, those people doing it remain guilty just because God gave them permission. This is extremely um, reminiscent of, of chapter uh, 10 in Isaiah, where Isaiah tells the people of Assyria that you are chosen to be the rod of God's anger. God is allowing you to come and punish the Jewish people. But you took it way, way too far. That you bear responsibility for. So, um, so again, and, and, and it's, it's really important to keep this image in mind that yes, it is true that God is allowing the Jewish people to be punished and, he's, and the nations now have permission to do it, but that which they choose to do and the way in which they choose to do it, they can't get away with saying, oh God, you told us to punish them. You let us do it doesn't work that way if you choose to be evil you have to pay the price and that is what jeremiah is telling us here in verse three or actually god through his prophet jeremiah so now now that he got their attention jeremiah got their attention because he he said god loves you if anyone makes you suffer they will suffer for it however shemud varadonai beis yaakov listen to the word of god house of jacob Whenever the prophets use the term Yaakov, Jacob, and we'll find this in Jeremiah often, it's specifically chosen to use the term Jacob in reference to all of the tribes, all the 12 tribes of Israel, all of the sons of Jacob, as opposed to the term Yisrael, which often refers to the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes, as opposed to Yehuda, the, the two southern tribes, the southern kingdom. So when it specifically says Beis Yaakov, it's referring to everyone, all the families, uh, the entire house of Jacob, b'chol mish b'chol space Yisrael, and all of the families of the house of Israel. Listen, listen to this message. Ko amar Adonai, so says God. So now the prophet himself is addressing this to the people. Ma matzu avosichem bi avel. What did your forefathers find wrong with me? What did with your forefathers that started going astray that started leaving me what what did i do wrong that they decided to distance themselves from me and where did they go they went and followed things that are meaningless that are nothing and here would mean um they were um confused or they were just uh uh trying to think of the best translation of Ayah Balu is they were bewildered or they, or they just were they went into things that, that made no sense that just uh, they, they were just deluded I've seen that word used as a translation for this so God is saying did I do something wrong I rescued them from Egypt we're going to see in a minute I gave, brought them to the land I fed them I gave them to drink and so on let's see verse 6 Velo amru ayah Adonai no one said when, when they came to the land of Israel and they settled and they started building this nation, they didn't say to themselves, where is God? The God who helped us, the God who saved us. They didn't look for me. They didn't seek me so that they can live the way I'm asking them to live. Um, where is this God, Hamale Oson Omer, it's Mitzrayim, who took us out of the land of Egypt? Hamolichot Anubamidbar, that led us through the wilderness. Be'eretz Arava B'Shucha, through a land of that was that was wild and a land that was um um uh full of, of that was a, a a land of desert um shukha is actually means uh uh dug up like um 
like the land of ditches and the land there at Sea of Itzalmavis and a land of dryness, a land of death, meaning a land that doesn't support a lot of life. Be'eretz lo ovar bo'ish, a land where people did not pass through because it was such a harsh climate. It was not a place that supported human life. Um, and no one even settled there because of such difficult places but I led you through those places I took care of you and what did I do this is verse 7 I brought you to a land full of, of green um, farmland so that you can eat the fruits of this land and the goodness which this land had to give you but what did you do I brought you through all of this and instead of living in this wonderful land and saying where is God and then seeking God out. And then seeking out what it is that God wants from you, how it is that He wants us to live, and thereby worshiping Him. And so to speak, repaying Him for the kindness. Instead, what did you do? You went ahead and you came and you defiled my land. You 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 made it impure, you made it disgusting. And my inheritance, the portion that which I gave you to pass down as a land where you're supposed to build a wonderful society, instead you made it into a disgusting abomination. The priests did not say, where is God? And those that studied the Torah and understood the Torah, they did not know me either. They didn't teach about me. They didn't study about me. If you recall, in the last chapter, I pointed out really three aspects of the problem of idol worship. And the first two, and they kind of go in a, uh, in a succession. The first aspect is the lack of appreciation, the lack of hakarat hatov would be the Hebrew term, that that one should worship God because of all that God does for him or her or them. If the people, the people, if we recognize all of the wonders and greatness that God does for us every day, the natural result would be thankfulness towards him and doing what it is that he wants and living the type of life that he wants us to live. So, so the, the, this is the, the second aspect that I mentioned was the, what I called then the theological aspect, which is more. It's the next question. Now that I have received this from God, right? So what is it that he wants from me? How is it that he wants me to live? The answer, of course, being, as we'll see throughout Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, and we've seen throughout the prophets, is a life of living the ways of the Torah, which are tzedek umishba, justice and righteousness, uh, ms and chesed, truth and kindness. These are the things that he wants from us. This is how he wants us to live. So the, when one does idol worship, when one turns to idols, number one, he's not being thankful. He's, that's the first step. He's already gone out of the way. And he's already not being thankful to God. He's turning away from him. He's not thanking him. He's not, he doesn't have any appreciation for all that God did for him. And number two, when, what, when, if, when, when someone then goes ahead and doesn't think what it is that God wants from me. That's the next step. Okay, so you can appreciate God, but then you don't. But then you don't do anything. You don't live in the way that He wants you to live. You don't practice that way. That is the second stage. That is the stage of 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 what like the theological error. In other words, there's a point. There's a reason why He was good for you because He has a mission for you. He has a desire to see you live a certain way and teach a certain lesson to the world. This is where it says, first, you didn't care, you don't appreciate. And second, the priests didn't even say it was their job to teach you. To teach you, yes, we appreciate God, and therefore this is what you're supposed to do. Where is God? Search for Him, look for Him, worship Him. The Tov Sehat Torah, those that were the ones that should have been able to grasp and understand the rules of the Torah that I that I taught you, Lo Yidoni, you didn't use it properly, you didn't know me. You went and you used that knowledge. Viharoim and those leaders, the leaders that were supposed to lead you in the proper way, instead of doing that, Posh Ubi, they rebelled against me. Vahanevi'im and the prophets, the people that there should have been prophets in the street, prophets in the synagogue, prophets in the temple saying, this is how God wants you to live. This is what he wants from you. Instead, Nibu Vabal, they went and they said prophecies in the name of the Baal, which is the name of an idol, 
ba'acharei lo yo'ilu halachu, and and to just to drive an extra nail in the coffin. What did they go after? Rather than going after me, that has the power to help them, they went after that that idol that has absolutely no power, has absolutely no meaning. The third step after this, those two, is the step of arrogance. That once you don't appreciate God, and then you don't even think about what it is that He wants from you, then you start attributing all of the power to yourself. You start looking to other things, completely base things, com- things that have no meaning, things that are completely only for self aggrandizement. It's only things, and, and, and you start looking at yourself as if you're some sort of something great. But that step of arrogance is, your Mio is, is not yet criticizing that arrogance. He will later on. But at this point, he's criticizing, moving away from those first two steps. Lochain, therefore, says God, I'm in verse 9. Od Ariv Itchem no Amadonai. I will still I I still have an argument with you and or I will yet continue to argue with you. This argument doesn't it means more of like a like a, a court case, a uh, a um a quarrel that I have with you, says God. I have a problem with you. Yes, it's true that I remember that love, and this is how we started, and it's true that I have that wonderful bond. But I got a problem with how you guys have acted. We made that beautiful covenant. We established that wonderful relationship. But where did it go? Yes, b'nei b'neichem ariv. So says God, and, and not only with you, but you and your descendants, because this is, just goes on. You raise your children this way. You were raised this way by your parents. This problem is continuing. This problem is ongoing. And God says, if you want to know about this appreciation, Look at all of the nations of the world. Don't, it's not just you. Everyone has something that they hold on to, a heritage, a tradition. They have their own, so to speak, in this particular case, they have their own gods, their own religions. Not so much that they're, 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 is God saying here that their gods have any real meaning, so to speak, in the sense that they're, obviously there's a, one creator, there's one God, but every nation has its, has its background, has, has its tradition, has what they look up to, has the things that they cherish, the things that they appreciate. <speaking in Hebrew> just even if you would just go over to the islands and, of Kitim, those faraway islands, go look all the way, anywhere in the world, Uru, and see how they live. The Kedar, go all the way to Kedar. Shilchu, send messengers there, and think hard about what you see. And see if there's ever been something like that. Every nation has something special. Every nation has a tradition. Every nation has something that they can contribute to the world, something that they do. And they cherish those traditions. The trades that they have, the skills that they have, the art that they have, the music that they have, the culture that they have. They, and all of that enriches this world and makes this world a better place. <laughs> and what do you have? Think about it. God is telling the Jewish people, you have this incredible tradition, this incredible thing that God himself, I myself, God says, took you out of Egypt. I myself walked you through the desert. I myself brought you and established you in this beautiful land because because I wanted you to take this tradition and this lesson and that was going to be your contribution to the world. But Ha'emir, this is verse 11, Goy Elohim, does a nation change away its gods? Does the nation go ahead and say, I'm throwing out everything that I stand for? Even though in their particular cases, their traditions have some serious flaws. When they believe in the God of the wind or the God of fire or the God of the moon or the sun and the stars, those are meaningless gods. But they still cherish those, those traditions that they have and they still believe and the importance of the lessons that they have and what they can contribute to the world, they don't do that. And theirs aren't even worth nearly as much as yours. Your tradition is so much more. You actually have God to introduce to the world. The Ami, but my nation, God says, Hemir kvodo belo yoil. They went ahead and they took all of its honor. And what is its honor? The honor of every nation is its history. Honor of every nation is what it has special that makes them special. And they went and threw it all out below Yoel and exchanged it for something that's useless, that's meaningless. They went and worshipped the idol Baal. Totally meaningless, nothing. 
Shomu Shamayim Azos, this is verse 12. May the heavens just be completely distraught and completely um, uh, uh, in, 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 in awe, but this is a bad kind of awe over this issue, over this fact. Visa'aru, and they should be. Visa'aru means a. Um, it's like from the language of a sar, of a storm, and they should be uh, just blown away and blown around and charvumahod uh, and be completely uh, horrified. No, uh, Madonai, so says God. The world should look at this and see what in the world is happening here. This people that are so privileged has such a close relationship with God. They have so much to teach, so much to contribute. If they lived according to the way God wants them to live, Oh, how much wonderful, how much more wonderful the world would be. And what did they do? They turned it away and traded it for nothing. They traded it for less than nothing. They traded it for useless nothing. The lo yoil, the thing that is nothing, that gives nothing, it means nothing. Then in verse 13, we're going to complete this, today's, today's podcast. Kishtayim ra'osa so'ami. My nation has done two evils. Remember, I, I've been pointing out this whole time this duality of the two steps that's been going on over here. The first step is appreciation for God. The second step is, now that I appreciate God, what is it that I'm supposed to do? What is it that He wants from me? How do I, so to speak, repay Him? Oh, see us. Remember, God talked about the, the relationship as if it was a marriage and the wonderful love between the two people. So the wonderful love, if we, if we look at it from the perspective of either spouse, whether it's from the husband's perspective or the wife's perspective, each one, they love each other so much. They, first, the first step in the marriage is recognizing how much you appreciate the other person, how much she does for me, how much he does for me, how wonderful it is to be in his presence or her presence. That's the first step. That's the love. That's the stage of appreciation. The next stage is, okay, now how am I going to live my life that I will, what are the things that she needs that I can provide? What are the things that he needs that I can provide? And then they go to the, that's the second step. Both of these steps are Both of these steps are the steps that my nation have done bad and done wrong. They abandoned me. How do they abandon me? And I am the Makar Mayim Chaim. I am, I'm not just someone that did them a favor. I am the source of life, of, of living waters. I am the source of, of the, the waters that gives life to the world. I am where everything comes from, and they abandon me. Right? So what does this mean, they abandoned me? They didn't care. They didn't care about all of the wonderful things I give them. I am the source of all of the goodness, the Makar Mayim Chaim. And, and, and they just... Yeah, whatever they didn't appreciate it it doesn't mean anything to them and what did they then do instead of thinking about how to repay me so to speak how to treat me because I did such good instead they went they decided to dig themselves wells I was giving them this wonderful spring of water of fresh bubbling beautiful water instead they go ahead and they dig cisterns a cistern is an old way that they used to collect rainwater. And typically, cistern water is stale. It's it's sometimes foul. It's just not good water. And not only that, but they broke nishbarim. They were broken cisterns. They didn't even hold the water. The water would leak out and get all muddy. They traded the great. They traded me, so they didn't appreciate me, and then they traded me away for something else. Instead of looking at how to, at how to. Uh, worship me, how to serve me, how to treat God properly, so to speak. Instead, they dug these cisterns that don't even hold water and all they got is mud. They traded the greatness of God for nothing. This is the end of this portion. I'm going to stop here and we'll continue with Jeremiah 2b. Thank you so much for studying together with me today.